All right, guys, today we're going to talk about bake shop principles. I know we've already got some stuff. We've got already have videos on about flour and sugar and um, I, I know baking powder, baking soda, but we're going to re, you know, vamp. We're going to redo all that. We're going to, you know, a uh, little uh, review here. Uh, I want to make sure that we're on the same page with all this stuff. So, uh, bake shop principles today, all right? Uh, baking soda, baking powder, double acting baking powder. Remember, you know, I'm just really quick here. I want you to understand. Uh, Armand, let me ask you a question. Is baking soda and baking powder have the same base? Yes, they do. Very good, Armand. Thank you for answering that question. <laughs> baking soda, baking powder, both are base of sodium bicarbonate. Remember that baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. Baking powder has an acid already present in it. Okay? Um, to activate baking soda, you need an acid and a liquid. Baking powder already has that acid, so what do you need, Matthew, only for baking powder? Or baking, uh, yeah, baking powder. What would you need for baking powder? Because you know baking soda needs an acid and a liquid. Baking powder already has an acid present. What would you need for it? Simply a liquid. Very good. Okay? So, to make it do like the old volcano did, you need that, uh, with the volcano used to baking soda. Remember you'd pour some vinegar in it to erupt, okay? That's what we're doing with this stuff. This chemical leavening agent differed from yeast. We're adding an acid liquid, and it's trapping in those gluten strands, pushing that dough up. This is, remember, chemical leavening. Uh, double acting baking powder. And I want to go back to Grandma, okay? When Grandma used to make her biscuits, she'd, she would set them on the bench top. Let them sit there for a couple hours. And a lot of times we would eat hockey pucks. You understand what I'm saying? They didn't get any rice because remember back to the, there we go again about the, the volcano. When you put that acid in there, it erupted. Okay, that's what's happening to these biscuits. They're already started to activate. They're already pushing that, the gas is already pushing that, uh, those trapped, in those trapped gluten strands, those pockets, it's already pushing it up in those pockets and pushing the rise up. If you don't put them in the oven, then you leave them setting out. It only goes so far, and then it busts, and then it comes back down. Okay? That's why you have hockey pucks for biscuits. you got to bake them as soon as you make them. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I made a rhyme. Bake them as make them. Okay? All right. <laughs> Double acting baking powder, though, although has that second gear. You can leave them setting out for a little while, and then put them in the oven. So if you're going to leave your, your biscuits setting out, make sure you use double acting baking powder. All right, sugar refinement process. I'm going to go through this real quick. I've already talked about it. Sugar is made from two items, sugar beets, sugar cane in the United States. Okay, mostly sugar cane. They take that cane, they'll crush it, they'll mix it, uh, they'll cook it, then they'll crystallize it. When they crystallize the, the, uh, the sugar, after they've cooked it and they've done all their uh, process through it, they're going to put it through a centrifuge. A centrifuge is a spinning thing. When all of the, what comes off of the crystallized product is sugar, what do you think it is? What was the first thing that came off of it? Molasses. Molasses. What would we make out of molasses this year already? Gingerbread cookies. Remember us making the gingerbread cookies, okay? Remember how harsh that stuff was? Really dark brown. Okay, that's the first refinement off of that sugar, okay? And what they have left is a real dark looking uh, sugar that is crystallized. They take that stuff and wash it off, steam it, put it through a steaming process. Then uh, they have that first refinement that we will use, and you'll see it in the grocery store. It's called sugar in the raw. It's called turbinado sugar. Okay? It's a dark sugar that looks like granulated sugar, but it's brown. Okay? It's not brown sugar. It's two different things. Okay? Turbinado sugar, that's the, the, uh, the first crystallized sugar that we'll see. Okay? Then they go ahead, they, they wash that stuff up, they clean it up, they recrystallize it. Go ahead. And then it turns into the granulated sugar, what we call table sugar, some of us. Okay? If we further, if they go ahead and process that table sugar and uh, they run it through a process and make it fine, you know, there's 10x, there's 6x, 2x, it's called uh, confectionery sugar, okay? It's powdered sugar. They powderize it, all right? Um, 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I've already talked about this in another uh, seg segment. Uh, brown sugar is simply granulated sugar with molasses added to it. Light brown is at the rate of 3.5% of molasses. 6.5% is the uh, rate for brown sugar. Powdered sugar, simply granulated sugar, has been super fine ground. Uh, you can substitute it for granulated sugar if you run out. Okay, the rate uh, is at, at the rate of twice as much. Uh, sanding sugar. Now, sanding sugar is that sugar that you would put on the top of a sugar cookie, uh, the top of a. Uh, you ever seen a, a, a muffin that has those big crystals of sugar on it? That's sanding sugar. Okay. Uh, it's used for decoration and such for uh, or garnish for muffins and cookies. Okay, go ahead. All right, flour. Uh, I'm going to do a real quick review about flour. Remember, flour is hygroscopic. What is hygroscopic? Remember the key word? Water attracting. Um, stuff in the bake shop. So let me just say this. If a, a recipe calls for two cups of milk and it's got flour and, you know, corn syrup and stuff that is hygroscopic, all the time, you, it might not mean two cups of milk. It might mean a cup and three quarters, or it might mean two and a half cups, or whatever. It could be different depending on uh, the uh, uh, moisture that the flour has taken on, or the corn syrup, or whatever. Uh, most important ingredient in the bake shop is wheat flour. Remember, wheat flour is all of the flour that we had on that cart, okay? Composite flour are flours that are not of non wheat. Uh, varieties could be rye flour, could be uh, corn flour, could be um, you know peanut flour, whatever you know soy flour. Um, but it's it's of a non-wheat variety. And let me just say this to review: wheat flour is the only flour that contains gluten. Okay, gluten is that elastic protein. Remember that definition of elastic protein. Remember the stretchiness of it. Okay. Soft wheat flour has little to no gluten. Soft wheat flour would use for cake making. Hard wheat flour has, uh, you know, a good percentage of, of gluten. You know, up to about 20 percent, down to about uh, six to seven percent. What what kind of flour, Matthew Lorenus, did we get? Matthew Lorenus, did we get when we uh, we would uh, put all-purpose flour when we put that mixture? Okay, we got all-purpose. I just said it. Okay, so I'm goofy, right? All-purpose flour. Uh, all-purpose flour. A lot of restaurants will use because it's, they don't really, um, they don't really, you know, specialize in anything. It, they can use it for cakes, or they can use it for muffins, or they can use it for biscuits, or you know, rolls, whatever. If you're a specialty restaurant, you will buy that specialty flour. If you need something that needs a lot of protein, in, a lot of stretchability, okay? Um, gluten is made up from two pro uh, components in wheat flour: gliden and gluten glide and glutenin when you put the liquid with them and you mix or knead them, it forms that gluten, that elastic protein, that stretch, uh, stretchability, okay? Uh, soft wheat, I've already said it, you would use for cake, low gluten, hard wheat, high gluten, uh, pizza, bread, uh, rolls, uh, I'm talking about yeast resin, resin stuff. Uh, let me ask you a question, Armand, is yeast living or is it a chemical? It's living. Yeast is a living organism. Chemical, uh, uh, let's review here real quick. Uh, what would one of the uh, chemicals be, Kelly, that we would use? Baking soda or baking powder, okay? Uh, remember, chemical is used for quick breads, something we can use right now, something we can mix up, put it in the oven. Yeast takes some time. Remember the 12, the uh, the uh, 10 steps of the process we talked about in yeast breads, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, on the second half of this video, okay, we're going to uh, split this up in two days so uh, we can take care of, you know, looking at it at home. Composite flours, we already talked about that. Whole wheat flours, remember, is the only, uh, it has two things still intact on it that wheat flour, regular, like all purpose, you know, whatever, doesn't have. What do they still have? Whole wheat, what does it still have on it? The bran and the germ. It still has the bran and germ intact, okay? Uh, remember that hard outside and the, uh, the, the fat of the grain, okay? So uh, usually more coarse ground. Uh, if I make whole wheat bread, usually won't make it with all whole wheat flour. Usually we'll make it uh, with a percentage of whole wheat flour and a percentage of wheat flour so we can get that fine uh, flour to make the gluten, you know, have the good gluten in it. Go ahead. Who 
Uh, purchasing flour in commercial bags, we usually purchase it in 50 to 100 pound bags. Uh, one thing about self-rising flour, and, I, and I'm just reviewing this because we've already talked about it, already contains a chemical leavening agent, baking powder. Okay? Uh, fats. Fats can include butter, margarine, oil, uh, emulsified shortenings. What, what, give me an example of an emulsified shortening, Megan. Emulsified shortening. Something we, used to, we make biscuits with. Crisco, very good. Okay? Um, usually stuff that is of animal products will go solid when it gets cold. If it is a vegetable product, unless it is emulsified, it usually will stay liquid, right? So lard would be a fat. Butter would be a fat. Is butter made from animals? Some of them are. Our, our butter is. Is margarine, margarine made from animals? No, it's a it's a uh, usually a vegetable product. Okay, usually butter is made from uh, milk, uh, you know, fat, and margarine is made from a vegetable fat. Okay, okay, all right. Um, fats considered shortenings in the bake shop. Now let me just say, shortening. What does it do? If I add fats, let's go back to the uh, uh, bread, yeast bread. If I have a dough that's called a lean dough, it doesn't have a lot of additives in it. It doesn't have sugar. It doesn't have fat. You know, the only thing a, a, a yeast bread must have is it's got to have yeast, it's got to have flour, it's got usually has to have salt because salt will control the growth of the yeast, and it's got to have a liquid. That's it. You can make bread all day long with that. All right. Usually just water. The more enrichments we put in bread, the softer the dough gets. When it says shortening, what does shortening do? It shortens those gluten strands. Okay. It's taking that tight knit, let's say, fabric of that bread, and it's tenderizing it. It's actually making it softer. Okay, so it's doing what it says it's named for. Okay, uh, and it also adds some flavor to it. Okay, uh, add some fat. Uh, it, it, we love humans love fat. We've already said that 15 times in this class. Okay, all right, go ahead. Thickeners. Uh, this last thing we'll talk about today is thickening agents. Um, you know, as far as the bake shop goes, cornstarch, we would thicken, uh, you know, puddings, uh, a, a, a whole gamut of desserts with. Uh, arrowroot is also a great thickener. We're going to go ahead and piggyback on this in our next chapter when we start uh, soup stocks and sauces because cornstarch and arrowroot are two great thickeners. In it. Tapioca is always, you know, the tropical, uh, the root of a tropical cassava plant. Does anybody like tapioca pudding? You know, those little pearls, you know, you can buy it in pearls or powder or whatever. Uh, you know, it's a great uh, thickener for puddings. Gelatin um, comes from the Collagen of Animals, animal protein. Remember, we talked about uh, where it heads and hooves usually. A lot of gelatin in the animals, uh, jello gelatin or gelatin sheets. And we talked about that. Have we, did you know that? Gelatin comes from the heads and hooves of animals mostly. Okay? And, uh, you know, we'll use a lot of gelatin in a lot of dessert stuff. Two types of gelatins are uh, sheet or leaf. You got to bloom it before you uh, use it. I mean, dissolve it in a cold liquid, and then go ahead and use it. Okay. Um, we'll talk about the. Uh, we'll talk about tomorrow chocolate. Uh, we'll talk about the steps in bread uh, making, and uh, and uh, a couple other things tomorrow. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll get on.